Morning class! How's it going today? I hope you're all doing well. Hope you guys are all looking forward to uh, um, the complete and utter destruction of the entirety of civilization because the U.S. has decided to have another election, completely unspenounced to the entire rest of the world. Kind of snuck up on us. Uh, anyway, that's just a little bit of election day satire for you. Anyway, um, how's all, how y'all doing? Hope you're doing all right. Lecture chat, let me know you're alive, please. Let's see, how many people do we have? How many people do we have watching right now? We got 38. That's not bad. Okay, so, anyway, um, so how did you guys find the test? Was the test okay? Hopefully the test was okay. I'd like to get uh, your feelings on the test, if I may. Um, feedback would be appreciated. What was good? What was bad? What did you think was good? What do you think was bad? That's answering, that's asking the same question several times, but you get the point. Um, doop -a doop doop. Doop -a doop doop. There are a few things that I'd like to talk about as well. Uh, before we sort of get into things. It was all right. Okay. I guess all right. Wasn't too bad. Okay. I'm getting kind of a... Yeah. Okay. Firm but fair, maybe? <laughs> okay. Um... Cool. I have solicited comments. Um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to talk to you guys about before we get to our lecture material for today. Um, number one, I found this really cool tool that I'd like to share with you guys because I think it might be extremely useful useful for you. For um, you know, you're gonna wish that I, that I had found this like three weeks ago and shown you, but. If you see, if you go to pythontutor.com, now this is a, it's a tool for debugging and profiling Python, but uh, if you take a look, it also has dropdowns for all kinds of other languages, including C, C++, and Java. And uh, it's, it's actually a really good tool. I like it a lot. So for example, if we have, you know, int i is equal to zero and, um, or int n is equal to 10 and int and fact, which will be the factorial if we set that equal to 1. And for i is um, int i is equal to 0, just writing a quick program here, i is less than or equal to n i plus plus um, n fact is, uh, times equals i and that, and then we print f n fact n factorial is equal to, there we go. That's a simple little C program. Let's visualize the execution. Executing takes up to 10 seconds. So this is interesting, because it'll actually show you what's in your stack which is really cool. So in main, we've got n, we've got n factorial, um, which are not assigned to anything yet. And you can step through the execution of each of the individual um, lines of code in your, um, in your program in this manner. So you can see in this particular one, I've introduced a bug because I was intending to calculate the value of the factorial, but my first value of i is 0, which of course anything multiplied by 0 is going to be 0. So if I just modify, uh, if I modify that, change that to 1, uh, oop, 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 oop. visualize, Doo -doo -doo -doo. there you go, you can, you can pull through and, you know, you can see how the factorial is calculated through subsequent loop iterations. And if you invoke functions, it'll th show you like how the functions are being added to the stack and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. So it's really cool. 
It's really cool. And uh, I think it's a really good uh, tool that you guys could uh, use to great benefit in this course and others. So there you go. Um, I've got a question about A4. Uh, that is a very good question because um, that was actually the next thing I wanted to talk about. So <clears throat> with respect to assignment four, um, assignment four is, yeah, it's a user friendly, it's user friendly debugging. Yeah, it's, I, I, I think it's, because it sort of frames things in the sense of, you know, we have the system stack and this is, these are the things in the system stack. Um, it's, I haven't tested it with pointers to see how it displays pointers, but yeah, uh, yeah, I absolutely can put the URL in the chat. Absolutely. There we go. Copy that. Paste that. Hubble blip. blip. There we go. Yeah, so um there you go. Hopefully that'll be helpful. Um sorry, I wasn't aware of this tool before like before um yesterday or something, so um, yeah, I didn't know that it had a C mode, so there you go. Um, anyway, assignment four. So assignment four is going to be released hopefully today, uh, by the end of either business or in sometime in the evening today. Um, it's going to be based on string manipulation. I personally think that the level of difficulty of this assignment is it sort of worked out to be higher than the level of difficulty of um, the majority of the assignment material so far. Um, so rather than expect you guys to have it done by Sunday, I'm pushing the due date for assignment four back a week. Now, please understand that I'm doing this because I believe it'll take you that long working on it in order to accomplish it. Um, so probably this means that there is going to be no assignment six. We'll see how it works out with the schedule, but I, I haven't quite worked out the details yet, but it is likely at this point that assignment six is not going to exist. Um, it might be that I can't I might not be able to have an assignment on the assembly and C++ material. I may even have to drop the C++ material entirely. We'll see how it works out. Um, it's kind of still up in the air a little bit, to be honest with you. But um, that's that's kind of that's kind of par for the course when you're generating a course as it's being given. Uh, I apologize that things aren't worked out in more detail ahead of time. Uh, it's not really an ideal circumstance, but hopefully next year um, the work we're doing this year will pay off with more stability. But um, anyway, so you're going to have two weeks to do assignment four. Um, I would recommend starting working on it this week. Uh, if, you f if you think that you can put it off till next Saturday to start working on it, then I think you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, but... I can tell you what the um, what the subject matter is. I guess I can tell you like roughly what the questions are going to be. Um, the first question is um, the Flash Kincaid um, grade level analyzer uh, formula for uh, basically you take a block of text encoded as a string and you calculate the uh, the Flash Kincaid um, reading level over it, which is a simple matter of uh, detecting how many sentences there are, how many words there are, and how many syllables they are, there are, and we make certain approximations about what a syllable is so that that's a reasonable thing to calculate. Um, you know, actual syllabalization is actually a, um, a PhD level sort of problem, but we can make some assumptions about what is a syllable that makes it very, very, like, makes it much easier for you guys. Um, you know, makes it reasonable. The second question is on um, format conversion for dates. So we, uh, you'll see it when you get there, but it's just like 
converting things from um, day, day, month, month, year, 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 year to like February 2nd, 1973 sort of, you know, written out style. Um, so there you go. And the third question is expression parsing. So you are going to write a program that takes a string that has in it a algebraic, um, well, not even algebraic, it has an expression that contains integer literals and, um, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulo, and you guys will write a program that takes that string, reads it for its various components, and then calculates that. That's a difficult problem. Um, but I think it's reasonable. Um, I think it's a good test, and if I, think, I think it's definitely possible if you have two weeks to work on it and the support of, you know, the grade team with respect to answers to questions on Piazza and that sort of thing. So we'll see how it goes. Um, anyway, so uh, with respect to assignment 5 and 6 based on C++ and ARM assembly, um, well... We're going to have to have an assignment on structures, which is the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. So I don't know if maybe we'll have an assignment 5 that is based on structures and then A6 will be like C++ and ARM, maybe. We'll see. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yes. So assignment 4 is due on the Sunday or the Tuesday of the week of the 14th. It will be due um, on the Sunday. Just like everything is due on a Sunday, this one will also be due on a Sunday. It'll be due the 15th. And you can see that, you know, unless we do, like, then A5 and A6, that's, you know, the schedule is getting pretty tight. Not to mention there's supposed to be a, another midterm in there somewhere, I think on the 29th. So we'll see. We'll see. It might... <sighs> We'll, we'll see. I don't think it's going to be feasible to have an assignment 6, which, me, of course, means that the um, the percentage of your grade that assignment 6 would have been will be shared among the other five assignments. I don't know. I think five assignments is probably a reasonable number of assignments for a course, but I had more ambitious plans. You know, I originally thought we were going to do 10 assignments in this course. Man, to be young and foolish. Oh my goodness. But anyway, um, so anyway, so that's the situation with assignment four. Uh, don't take, uh, don't, don't take it for granted, because this one is like, I don't know. Uh, basically, I, I I developed assignment four on Sunday, and by the time I had produced my solution for the uh, for the expression parsing question, I had like the feeling of satisfaction of having accomplished a programming problem. So I kind of feel like you guys will also have that feeling of satisfaction of having accomplished a programming problem, I hope. Anyway, that's my charitable interpretation to myself. Anyway, so there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about before we actually get to the uh, uh, to the um, lecture material. And that's this uh, report recently came down from the Faculty of Engineering, and it's about... Um, it's about how uh, uh, the student body feels that this semester is going as opposed to um, how uh, the faculty feels that this semester is going. And I think, at least as of October, and I think that the numbers really tell the tale. Um, if I can find, yeah, over, uh, respondent overall rating. So this is, uh, this is uh, we won't dwell on it, but I just think it's really interesting. So... We've got students and we've got instructors, and we were uh, they were basically asked, you know, how do you feel things are going, right? Um, uh, maybe they've got the question in here particularly, but overall experience rating, yeah. So this is your overall experience rating uh, for this semester. So the students. Uh, are, um, heh, you can see in terms of uh, very poor, poor, and fair, or neutral, the students, like, 
nearly 40% of the students think that this semester is going either poorly or very poorly. <laughs> um, you know, another, you know, 30% or so think it's going okay, and then the remaining 30% think it's going well or excellently, and very few people think that it's going excellently. If you contrast that to how the instructors think things are going, um, around like 5% view it as going very poorly or poorly the majority of the um uh like nearly like 50 percent of the professors think that things are going fairly um actually 53 percent think things are going well 16 percent percent think things are going very well and 25 think uh, percent things percent think things are going well uh you know neutrally i I would answer, as an instructor, I wasn't actually pulled on this. I kind of missed the boat because I was busy doing other stuff. But um, for me, if it was, if I was rating the courses I'm doing, I would say they're going well. Like, I think they're going okay. But I would say that, like, on an overall basis, um, things are going poorly. Although I think things have, have improved since September. Possibly. Then again, I'm not taking math classes. So, you know. So there you go. Anyway, I just thought that might be interesting for you guys. Um, so, let's not talk about 1MP3 stuff. Let's talk about structures. Slides. Topic 7. Here we go. Data structures. Whoa. There we go. All right. You guys almost saw the... Uh... Yeah. Um... Yeah, so, like, how are you guys? I've heard a lot from the... Um... I've heard a lot from the first years about, you know, how things are going, but, you know, primar like the primary amount of information I've collected you know, for my own information about how the second year uh, program is working out right now is coming primarily from people who are TAs in second year currently, and they're mostly comp sci. So, like, how is it going for you guys? I know that the math department is kind of posing a, a bit of an issue. Um, yeah, we finished file I.O. I'm pretty sure. Did we not? Maybe we have two more slides to go. Hmm. Let me see. Did we finish file I.O.? That's a good question. Maybe I'm just losing my mind. It's entirely possible. It's happened before. So, yeah, we definitely did F open. F close. Did we do this? Somebody please remind me if we finished file I.O. Hmm. Yeah. A decent amount of the professors are doing pretty well considering the circumstances, but I find online learning a lot r harder regardless of how the professor how good the professor is. Yeah, that's I think that's just I think that's the I think that's the like un uh that's like the irreducible element of the equation it's like if you if you factored out the real causes of your stress that's like one of the prime factors that can't be that can't be further disorganized or for further um split into more factors Two ao4 not the most organized yeah this year is a lot of background boring science yeah for you guys in the um in the mechatronics, this is your general year, right? Where you're doing the electrical stuff and the mechanical stuff and the, uh, uh, and, you know, stuff like this. Yeesh. F open. Okay. Well, good. 2PO4 is just turning into jets and is zooming. It's turning on the jets. Yeah, I think probably a lot of the problem... 
I don't even know how a lab is supposed to work online, to be honest with you. Like, what are they going to do? Send you guys all the lab equipment? Like, I think the chemistry people are particularly effed with respect to that. But, um, right. Yeah. Also, um, just so you know, um, Mr. Sun, I, I'm sorry I, uh, I was a little bit, uh, incensed by, by, by the question that you asked last time we had a lecture. It was, um, I, I, I feel I lost my cool a little bit, and I'd like to apologize for that. It was a fair question. I just, if you knew the number of hours I'd had to spend this semester dealing with people who forgot to submit assignments, it's just, ugh. Anyway. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> really. Yeah, too many assignments. You had to buy the lab equipment. That is gonna get impossible as time goes on. 300 bucks, jeez. Oy, oy, oy. Hmm. When I was working at Mohawk College, there was a, uh, there was a scheme that they were trying to develop that, uh, like, they were, they were trying to develop this project of having, like, VR laboratory equipment. Because lab equipment is extremely expensive, and if you could, you know, produce a VR simulation where you could do a lab, that would be something, right? But uh, as far as I know, the, the project didn't really, um, it didn't really take off, kind of for the irreducible problem that it's not possible to simulate physical reality completely. Yeesh. Okay. Well... I mean, I guess I, all I can say is hang in there, guys. Um, this is very much not the manner in which university is supposed to occur. I don't know how you're supposed to get a practical education online. So, you know. If it's software, it's a different thing because your computer is your laboratory. But, yeah, only 50 more days! Yes! Um... my goodness. Pie tin and rubber bands? Really? Oh my god. That's hilarious. You could go to your local grocery store and get your lab kit. Yeesh. Hmm. Well. Yeah. Well, anyway, we should probably cover some actual material today, so um, thank you for thank you for talking to me about it. It's like... It's important for me to know what's going on because, you know, I feel like the only way to address that gap that I showed you between the professor's impressions of things and the student's impressions of things is for the professors and the students to talk to each other. So, um, I would, like, I appreciate, um, us take, like, you guys taking the time to, to tell me what the haps are, because it's important, I think, but, uh, when will this year end? Anyway, so, F Open. Um, to review briefly, F Open works pretty much like Open does in Python. You provide it a file name, and you provide it a mode expressed as a string, and that's actually the exact same way as open works in Python, I believe with the same mode tags as well. It's kind of interesting. When you get right down to it in Python, some of the Python functions that you all know and love are just C functions that have been, you know, remove the F has been removed. I think printf, is, uh, printf and print, print share a similar relationship, uh, although print is a little bit, you know, anyway. Um, so if you want to open a file, f open, f open returns a, uh, pointer to a file object. I'm going to call them object e objects, even though this isn't object oriented programming. So 
just think of it as being an object but without the methods. Um, so the file object is, that's the file stream. You pass that to the other file um, file functions and that's how you interact with the file. You never really have to directly modify the file structure or the, um, the file stream object uh, at all. So that's good. Um, so let me just see what you guys are saying. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, if there's any, if you guys can think of anything that I can do to help you guys in your struggle this semester, um, you know, I'm always open to suggestions. So, um, anyway, so when you have opened a file uh, for streaming, it's always important to close that file when you're finished with it. This is the same. This is the same. Ah, you gotta get rid of it. Blah. It's um. It's exactly the same type of situation as you have with malloc. When you allocate m the, uh, memory dynamically to a pointer, it's always very important that you return those system resources back to the operating system using free. In the same manner, it's very important that you close file streams once they're opened, uh, when when you're no longer finished, when you're no longer needing them or using them, or you know you've finished uh, with the file stream. Similarly to how the operating system has a table of memory addresses that are mem regions of memory that have been assigned to various processes, um, the operating system also keeps track of who's opened what file. <clears throat> Normally with the purpose of trying to assure some degree of exclusivity uh, to files that have access, or programs that have access to files. So you know, you can run into some pretty nasty types of errors uh, called race conditions. If you have a file that's opened by more than one program and more than one pro program is modifying that file, uh, if that's not done in a very strict and controlled manner, you can run into these types of errors called race conditions, where um, basically if two programs are competing for the same resource and whoever gets there first, you know, does something to it that modifies it in such a way that, you know, uh, process two is no longer, it's no longer meaningful for it to make that modification. It'll make that modification anyway. And basically whoever arrives first might have their data overwritten, which is data loss, which is a problem that's difficult to detect or, you know, uh, you know, anyway, so there are all, and you know, you guys probably won't even be talking about that sort of thing until you hit third and fourth, probably fourth year, um, when you start talking about um, real-time systems and, you know, uh, semaphores and that sort of thing. So anyway, so that's, you know, down the pipe, but fclose just tells the operating system, okay, I'm done with the file, you can use it for whatever else you want, which is good just as a dynamically allocated pointer needs to be freed when it is no longer needed, a file stream must be closed when you're finished with it. So int f close file stream needs a semicolon, I see. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. It takes a file stream as an argument and it closes it. Uh, it returns zero on success and end of file on failure. So you can check for that. F scanf is difficult to write a pun for. So, if you want to treat your file like you are reading information from standard input, uh, you can actually use f scanf, which is file scan function, and f printf, which is file print function. Um, so the uh, type signature is returns an integer. F scanf. We give it the file stream object, of course. And then we have our format string and all of our arguments. After the first argument, usage is precisely the same as any of the scanf, or uh, it's exactly the same as scanf or any of its cousins. Um, this is, in fact, a scanf cousin. So, you know, the only difference is you have to provide a file stream up front. 
The return value is the number of input items successfully matched and assigned. Um, for example, the number of format specifiers in the string format that were successful, in the format string that were successful. So there you go. Scanf. This is a way of doing it over files. fprintf is equally difficult to write a pun for. Um, fprintf, you provide the file stream, then you have your um, format string and all of your arguments in exactly the same manner as we would have, you know, in exactly the same manner as we use printf, we can use fprintf. The only difference is that rather than targeting standard output, we are targeting some particular file in the file system that we opened with fopen. So this writes characters into a file in exactly the manner you would expect. Um, the first argument is the file stream. It returns the number of characters written successfully, and if successful, and a negative number upon failure. And that's it. Enough said. Let's see. Do I have questions? Cool. Um, F. Read any good books lately? Read any good books? Yeah, the pun doesn't quite work, but that's okay. If repeatedly invoking fscanf isn't your style, perhaps you'd prefer writing chunks of files directly into arrays. Uh, this works particularly well if um, if the file is, you know, well, it's, um, this works best if the file doesn't really require the formatting that is provided by the scanf function. So if you're reading in something like a bitmap, for instance, uh, a bitmap, um, nobody really uses bitmaps anymore, but, you know, um, what a bitmap is, is it's a file header with certain information, like the size of the, um, the size of the image and, you know, various other things, metadata, and then it's just a list of RBG values and, you know, a number of RBG values that's the size of the list, and it doesn't really format, like it doesn't insert commas between them or anything like a CSV file it does. It's just bits, a stream of bits. Uh, fread would be a good way of reading in that sort of thing. Uh, if you just need to get memory into an array, use fread. So, pointer is a pointer to the memory block you're writing to. Always make sure that enough space has been allocated to pointer in order that you can't don't have to run in that you're not running into unallocated memory space because of course that means that we will get a uh, knock on our door from our old nemesis segfault. Um, it needs to be at least the size of at least as big as size multiplied by n mem b, which are these other parameters. So size is the size in bytes of each element to be read. So this is ch how we are chunking our data out. And n mem b is the number of elements to read, each uh, being the size of size. So it's like we are taking our file. We are considering it to be just a sequence of we, just some random binary data. And we decide like what the what the bit width is of the individual elements of that file and we decide how many elements there are in that file these are these two arguments uh, so for example if you wanted to read in that file as a character array then uh, size would be size of char right um, and you know n mem b would be however big the file was but but mr professor sir you don't necessarily know how big the file is when you read it i know um if you set it to be large then that probably would be okay and it probably if you set it to zero it'll just do the whole thing um stream is of course the file stream so the file stream comes at the end in this one so you know anyway so there you go fread returns the total number of elements successfully read. So, of course, you can check that against nmemb to see if you read in all of the elements that you thought you were going to. Um, I have a question. 
Can we edit the cursor position in the file? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, it's not included in this, though. Um, give me two seconds. Uh, where's the textbook? There we go. Um, yeah, you totally can add it, the cursor position. Um, I just, you know, didn't include it for reasons of brevity, because we have to keep moving in this course. Um, fseek. The function that you're looking for is fseek. Um, prototype is int fseek file uh, pointer file stream comma long int offset comma int whence. I'm not sure what whence means, but if you look up the documentation for fseek, then you'll find what you're looking for. There you go. Um, <clears throat> there you go. So, anyway, F right. If you wish to re uh, do the reverse process of taking a um, an array and just writing that data directly into the memory, uh, then you would want F right. Um, it would take a constant void pointer. Pointer is a pointer to the array of elements to be written. Size is the size in bytes of each element of pointer. Um, uh, because pointer is a void pointer, uh, that means that it can be a pointer to any data type. So the, we need to have that um, we need to have that uh, information relayed to fwrite in some manner. Nmemb is of course the number of elements to be written, and the same as it was in fread. Stream is obviously our old friend, the file stream. And fwrite returns the total number of elements successfully written to the file stream. And Fioff World Cup. Ha! That's a terrible pun. Um, it's F end of file. So all this reading from files is fine, but how do we know when we're finished? We use the Fioff function. FEOF tends, uh, it tests to see if the file stream has reached the end of the file. Um, the input is the file stream, naturally, and the output is non-zero if the file, end of the file has been reached, zero otherwise. So in terms of our, you know, rough approximation of integers as booleans, it returns a false if you're not at the end of the file and a true if you are at the end of the file. So there you go. So here's an example. We have a, this is a program which reads and writes sequentially, um, it reads and prints a file, pardon me. So we declare a file pointer, cf pointer. Um, we f open clients.txt in read mode. If that is not equal to null, uh, or if that's equal to null, then we put s file could not be opened, else um, we do stuff with it. Now, here's an interesting thing, because I don't think we've seen this before yet. We've not seen assignment inside of a if statement condition before, but it's actually valid. That's actually a way that you can do things. Um, like, the way that we would have been doing things before now is we would have said, you know, we would have put cf pointer is equal to f open clients.txt comma r, we would have put that on the line before. And then we would have just referred to cf pointer down here. That's like, yeah. Um, I would recommend doing that. I don't think that this is the wisest thing to do stylistically. It's perfectly valid and it'll work and, you know, work out with the compiler and all the rest of it, but it definitely, it confuses conditionals and assignments. And it's, it's also interesting. It's like, 
if you invoke a function which modifies global variables inside of inside of an if statement, that if like that function will execute, those variables will be modified. It's just that um, you know, it's not explicitly an assignment statement in the code itself. So, you know, someone might look through your code and not like not see it as being an assignment. But, you know, at any rate, um, it's another one of these C situations of possible but not recommended. It's like going to 150% on the nuclear reactor. Which is a reference to The Hunt for the Red October. If nobody has seen that movie, that you, you that's your other piece of... Um, oh, that's your... Okay, that's this class's movie suggestion for this class. Hunt for the Red October. Uh, the other class, somebody made a reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey, so that was their mo uh, movie recommendation. Anyway, so... Else, we, um, we print a header row... We f scan f an account name balance uh, account name and balance from the file, and then while end of file is not reached, we print it and then we read the next one. Once we've reached the end of file, we f close. So, if we have a file that contains these lines 100, 200, 100 Jones, whatever, 200 Doe, whatever, etc., etc then these would be printed out into standard output for us by this program. So there you go. And Q demo. Okay. I'll listen to you, the slides. Just because I like you. I brought you into existence, so I guess I should probably do what you say. So if we take a look at clients.txt, we've got these clients. Um, which are all either Smash Brothers characters or people that should be Smash Brothers characters. And then we've got the function, which is fig11, etc., etc., which is exactly the code from the lecture slides. So there we go. If we compile that, gcc w all figure 11 underscore 06.c there we go it compiles without any compiler warnings or errors whatsoever then we can execute a dot out since we didn't specify an output file name and you can see it has vomited forth all of the information that was in that file now obviously you can do more interesting things with a file with the information in a file than just print it out to standard output like it's you know a, a relatively trivial case however um once it's in, you know, you can imagine allocating an array um, that contains all of this information and then, you know, f populating that array by reading the file, performing the mani manipulations over that data, and then producing outputs that you can send other places, the whole shebang. But, um, yeah, anyway, that's how you read files. Yup. Hey, prove me wrong. Um, actually, uh, those last three I, uh, I just put into there for the meme value. I actually don't... You may find this surprising, but I don't actually have very strong feelings about what character they should next add to Smash Brothers. Uh, I feel like with seven, like, what is it, 80 some odd characters now, they probably have enough characters. <laughs> I don't... I'm not... I don't have a particular like axe to grind with respect to any particular character that was in that that uh, that's uh, going in Smash Brothers, but yeah. Um, Saitama, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, Saitama, but he has to have like the the jumping and um, the jumping and movement abilities of a normal human being to compensate. Um, anyway, so that's files. Um, huh, it's interesting. I thought I I completely forgot that I had to finish off file I/O. I was panicking, uh, producing the uh, 
the next, the topic seven slides. But anyway, <clears throat> um, Chrono would be good, yeah. Um, um, I kind of like the goofball characters. Um, like Piranha Plant. I think Piranha Plant is a cool addition. Like if I were to, uh, if I were to suggest someone, it would be like, I don't know, like the dishes that Mario uses in Yoshi to move the things around or something. I don't know. Something from an old Nintendo, like an old, old Nintendo game. But anyway, um, so let's briefly dive into data structures. So. Let's get some structure in your life. Up to this point, we have had no abstraction mechanism mechanisms in C besides functions and no abstraction mechanisms, mechanisms for uh, data other than arrays, uh, arguably pointers as well. So let's imagine, hypothetical situation. We have a database that contains the names, email addresses, and pinball high scores of customers stored in a CSV file. So we've got John Boring. His email address is johnboring.whatever.com. That's his pinball score. We've got Sally Plain, uh, sally.plain at whatever.com. That's her pinball score. We've got Nancy Snore uh, at her, at Nan uh, who has the email address Nancy Snore, nancy.snore at whatever.com. And Peter Bland, uh, peter.bland at whatever.com. And then we've got Thamarius the High Elf at Elder, uh, who has the email address eldercabbage at ancientorderofpurplewizards.com who has the best high uh, pinball high score. Ooh. We could group this data by field into arrays, or we could use a struct to make a record data type. What I mean by that is you could have an array that has all of the names, you could have an array that has all of the emails, and you could have an array that has all of the scores. Or you could create a record data type that contains a name, a email, an email, and a high score, an high score. And then you could have an array of these records. Such a thing is possible using structures. I have a question, though. Let me see. Is this... Are these slides up on Avenue? No, they're not. Ah, oh, jeez. Ah, oh, jeez. Sorry. They're very much in a draft state, so... But I'll, I'll put them up for you. Considering I probably won't think about it again till Thursday. Um... <laughs> That's topic six. Topic seven. Are we in week eight? I forget. Whatever. This is where they're going. Boom. There we go. So, that's not the slides. Get out of there, you. All right, so, a structure uh, groups several variables together into a single data type. It's important to understand that structures are a type of type definition. Uh, they are roughly analogous to classes in Python if you remove the methods. So the way that Python classes hold fields is kind of similar to the way that a structure holds fields. You have to create variables of the type of the structure to actually hold data in the same way that you have to create an object of a class in Python in order to actually have data in an object. Classes themselves are just definitions. They don't actually hold data, just like structures are just definitions. They don't actually hold data. This creates a new data type customer with the fields name, email, and pinball. I have questions. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> One punch. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, rather than get into the next bit, uh, it's now 1222, uh, 1220, so I think that's our class. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention, folks. Um, we shall continue this on Thursday. Um, I'll take any questions uh, that you have. Questions, comments, slash suggestions for new Smash Bros. characters. Are there more things in 
see previous replies. Um, yeah, more Smash Brothers characters. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna think carefully about what who I want to see as a Smash Brothers character. Um, Julius Caesar would be cool. Mm. But he's not a video game character, so. Mm. I'd like to see Shovel Knight promoted. Like, some of the indies. Um, oh, yeah, no, dude. Um, wait to thank me until you see the assignment. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not that bad. It's not like, it's not like ultimate destruction, but Chrono Trigger, yeah. Um, Chrono Trigger, yeah, I agree. Um, oh, you know who'd be fun is, um, the rich guy from Monopoly? Because, like, Monopoly, technically speaking, there have been lots of Monopoly video games, like, going all the way back to, like, the Nintendo Entertainment System. So, you know, the, Mal the Monopoly guy, technically, uh, you know, although that's kind of splitting hairs between characters that... Uh, have been in video games and characters that originated in video games. So maybe that makes the Monopoly guy ineligible. Um, hmm. Pepsi Man! Pepsi Man, yes! Meme characters all the way. Um, how about the guy from Stardew Valley? Or if not Stardew Valley, how about somebody from Harvest Moon? Like... If they can adapt Steve from Minecraft into a Smash Brothers character, then certainly they can do Harvest Moon. You know? Anyway. You guys have classes to get to. And I'm sure... Hmm. No. Oh. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, there goes the views. There we go. You. I even have time for games. Uh, I haven't had a lot of time for games this semester that's true but you do kind of need something you know to be able to just shut your brain down a little bit at the end of the day lately i've been playing breath of fire uh on the uh snes you know that thing where if you get a nintendo subscription you got all these nes and snes games well i've been playing breath of fire which is it's like trying to be both dragon quest and final fantasy at the same time um, the item names and what they do are completely unintelligible. Um, one of those games that was designed for an instruction manual. But, you know, I've been able to play a little bit of that. You know, I haven't had much time for video games, it's true. Um... But hey, um... A life without video games isn't worth living. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta maintain a little bit of it, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Can I ask a test question? Yes, of course. Please. Yeah, I've been enjoying Breath of Fire. Um, it seems comp competently put together. I haven't gotten like. It's it's been inter like it's been good enough to keep my attention and I have like it's been interesting enough to keep my attention attention despite the fact that I paid like zero money for it technically speaking. Uh, so if a game if you get a game for f for free and like that you can enjoy that game despite having invested like absolutely nothing in it beforehand then I it, it it's got to be at least a, a decent game, right?
for the third question on the push function, how, after finishing with the allocations, how can you free the allocated memory? Well, it depends, right? It depends on what you mean by that. Um, if you're using realloc, then you don't have to worry about it, right? Realloc automatically frees the old thing and gives you a new thing that's like built that's baked into the function. Um, if you were using like if you weren't using realloc and you were just using malloc, um, then it would be like allocate new memory one larger than old memory. Uh, copy all elements over, add new element to end, and then free old uh, allocated memory. So, um, generally speaking, the array itself doesn't need to be freed unless um, you've popped every single element out of the stack, and even then, like, that's kind of like... We didn't do the pop function, so you don't really have to worry about it. You were only pushing, right? Mm. Wild Arms. Ooh, Xenogears. Okay, so I absolutely love Xenoblade games, except, well, I really, really, really liked Xenoblade Chronicles, the first one, and I rather liked uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X, despite the fact that it was a bit strange. Um, Xenoblade 2, it was like I finished it, but I didn't finish the DLC because the characters are annoying. And it's like very, like it's much less about the setting and much more about the characters. And it's like, I don't care about the characters. Like, I get it. You're generic anime protagonists. Like, you know? Um, it was also a lot more fan servicey. But, Suikoden, though, I've heard of that. Hmm. Wild Arms. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Xenoblade has to has to work pretty hard to win back my affection at this point. Yeah. Anyway, I think I'm going to end that there. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention, folks. I'll be seeing you on Thursday.